Hello and welcome back. If you follow the channel, you know that I recently posted a video about a trio of awesome vintage generators from the HP 3300 series. But in order to make the video, I had to get all the neglected eBay instruments working like new again. We repaired the granddaddy of them all, the HP 3300A, in the previous episode. This time, we turn our attention to its successor, the HP 3310A, which happens to be my favorite in the series. This one did not need a repair, but a lot of viewers wanted to see the entire calibration procedure, as they either had the same instrument or were just interested in the topic. Indeed, a full calibration of such instruments is usually necessary, but can be intimidating. They almost always call for a long list of specific HP measurement instruments. But don't let yourself be put off by this. In the modern world, you already have the two tools that replace most of these. A digital multimeter and a modern digital oscilloscope are all you need. Although I always have a kick pulling out the exact required instrument from my large HP collection. You can do most of this with what you already have. So here we go, bonus video about the 3310A calibration. So in order to calibrate it, you have to go through the 21 steps and adjust a whole bunch of uh, viable resistors and capacitors. Shouldn't be too hard because we have the manual. So here's our little 3310A and there's more in it than you'd think. Chock full of stuff on the top, on the sides, and on the bottom with plenty of adjustments everywhere. There are about uh, 17 adjustments, so we'll go over that. Uh, but why does it need that many components to do a simple oscillator? Uh, well, that's because of how it works, which is uh, pretty clever. And it's the same principle as the, uh, the older one. I think it is a good time investment to familiarize yourself with the principle of operation of the instrument, but it's not strictly necessary. The procedures are written so you can go through them without any prior knowledge. However, if you hit a snag like we did in the previous 3300A calibration, it will come in handy. By the way, this works similarly to the 3300A as explained in the previous video. It is basically a very refined version of a 555 timer producing a triangle wave, which is then shaped into a square wave and a sine. Fortunately, this calibration went swimmingly, so we don't really need to go into more details here. It also helps if you identify your adjustment points in advance. In this case, they are on three boards. There's a top board, bottom board, and a side board. And uh, for example, my voltage is here. My test points are there for the uh, voltage. There is a tricky test point here. That's on the lead of a component for a triangle wave adjust. My sine wave distortions here, and here is a funny one where you have to bend a capacitor. We'll go on this later on. And all the frequency and uh, symmetry adjustments are over here. And it seems on, on this instrument there is one adjustment per band, both for symmetry and frequency. So there's a whole bunch of pots, uh, but there's a lot of. Uh, redundant thing you do you do the, the same adjustment many times over the frequency and this one took me a while to find there is a flatness adjustment here but it actually is a capacitor that you have to change entirely it's not an adjustment you have to select a part so uh, this looks pretty straightforward actually and also just to annoy, there are several versions of the same board. This is Rev C, this is Rev B, and it's not obvious the one you have. And I figured out the difference where, where the test points are here versus over here. So I have Rev B. The first step is usually adjusting the power supply, which is quite important in an analog instrument. 
The requirements are usually tight. Here it has to be adjusted to a hundredth of a volt. But there is only one adjustment for the plus 10 volt here. The other voltages, the minus 10, the plus 25 and the minus 25 just have to be checked after that. Minus 10 is less tight, only within plus minus 50 millivolts and the high voltage ones are not critical at all, just within one volt. The pot is accessible through the bottom of the instrument. And the label everything, so it makes it really simple. So this is ground, plus 10 volts, right, and what we do, yeah, you just one adjustment and it adjusts everything. And 10 volt adjust is this fellow over here is written on it, okay? So on we go, clunk, yep, worked. Oh, well that's pretty good. 10.0012, well I guess I don't have to adjust that one. It's already adjusted, okay. Let me move on to the minus 10 volts, see if that's... Minus 9.99, all right. Okay, and then plus 25 and minus 25, you don't have to do very much. It has to be within one volt. Minus 25. Plus 25, all within spec. All right, well, that was easy. Just for the fun of it, I added one zero to it, but it's plus minus 10 millivolts, so we're plenty fine. In the next step, we need to adjust the tip of a triangle wave to zero volts on the oscilloscope. The signal to monitor is at A1TP11, which means test point 11 on board A1. It should be a pin labeled TP11 on the PCB. Strangely, the output of the instrument has to be set to square wave, not triangle, and on the time stand range. Next check, we have to check that the waveform comes right at zero. It does, so no adjustment to do there. Whoa, I'm surprised, this is pretty good. Usually the eBay instruments I get are all over the place. But moving on, the next adjustment is the one that needs to be done carefully and cause us trouble in the previous video. It's the symmetry adjustment, making sure that the positive and negative current sources that charge and discharge the capacitors are exactly equal and opposite. In this instrument, this has to be done three times. First on times 100, dial on 50, then with the dial on 5 with another pot, then in the times 1 range with the dial on 50, and then checked in the same range with the dial on 5. There is a note that the settings interact, so we'll probably have to loop over this a couple of times until it's all in range. To do this adjustment, you measure the sync output, not the main instrument output. The procedure calls for a digital counter, which I will use here, but if you don't have one, you could use the duty cycle measurement on your oscilloscope. That's where a modern digital scope really helps. Next is symmetry adjustment. So I have the sync output, which is a square wave, uh, going to the counter and I take the period from A to B and I put A going down, B going up, and it's about 100 microsecond. And now I reverse. I have A going up and B going down, so I'm measuring the other half and it's 100 0.03, same value, so that, this is actually fairly well calibrated. It only to, needs to be precise to one digit and it's precise to like another one behind. And I have to do it at the other end of the scale at one microsecond per half pulse, 0 0.0021, and then if I invert it, it's 0 0.0039, so good enough. They have to be within 10 microseconds of each other. And then you have to do it a third time at an even lower frequency. Dial 1, 2. So we're going super slow now. And this one's a little further. 1008 over here. 
and one oh oh one two over there. So which pot is that? A one one sixty two. One oh nine. One oh one white. Even better now. Nine eight. One oh seven. Okay. So that is fine too. And then I have to verify that. If I get to 50, it still works. So there you go. 10.1, 10.1, okay. So once again, this instrument calibration is outstanding. It just needed a little tweak on the slowest range. Frequency is completely off though by something like 20% which is quite curious given that everything else is so perfect. We are finally coming to that adjustment. First we have to adjust the dial centering partially mechanically and partially electronically. The mechanical adjustment is done by monitoring the voltage on the center pin of the frequency pot, adjusting it to 900 millivolt then loosening the dial and recentering it so it is on the graduation 5. It turns out that's pretty difficult as the shaft tends to rotate when you loosen and tighten the dial. So you end up with an offset, say 880 millivolt instead of 900 millivolt when the dial is on 5. In a second step, you then compensate for the mechanical error electronically by setting the voltage on test point A1 TP1 to be equal to the frequency pot voltage error, in this case, minus 20 millivolt. And for the next step, we have to adjust the center button on the center, and I noticed it was slightly crunchy over here, and the crunchiness disappears when this is pushed. Uh, it turns out there's a scratch on the back of the surface, uh, so I'm going to polish that out first. A small nick right there, you can feel it. I'm just going to file it away. Oh, yeah, pretty bad. Well, somebody has been here before. This is not an original nor the correct screw. Same here for that ring. Yeah. It's a friction wheel and definitely has some mileage in it. It was very dirty. I can still feel it. It's the grease instead of oil. Ah! That is the answer. So that was annoying, you have to put the button mechanically so that when it's at 5, it's about at 900 millivolts, but that's super tough to do. So you get it at, uh, I am 0 0.880. And then, there's another test point and you just correct for this 20 millivolts. So I am 20 millivolts off, so I need to be at minus 20 millivolts over here. There you go. And that will offset the mechanical adjustment. Yeah, pretty good. Slowly moving along here, finally we get to the frequency adjustment part. It turns out there are no less than 7 adjustment pots. One for the 100k range, one for the 10k range, two for the 1k range, one for sine and one for ramp, 
then on to the 100, 10 and unit range. Once again, I'll do it with my trusty frequency counter because I can, but a digital scope frequency indication would have more than enough precision for this adjustment. Now, finally, we are going to do what we wanted to do, which is a frequency calibration. Uh, but I have recentered a dial, so that might have fixed part of it. Um, Connect the sink to the counter, dial to 50, range to 100k. Whoop, we're going to go to 5 meg. I should do is get rid of this. Yeah, there we go. Okay, at 50 meg the square is not very square anymore. Uh, am I at 50 ohm? No, I'm not in 50 ohm. There we go. Okay. If I do frequency. Uh, almost. So this should be 5 megahertz. A1R6. This one over here. But other direction. Okay, we were fairly far off. And almost 5 megahertz. The analog instruments, when you get better than 1%, you're pretty happy. So this is this will count as 5 megahertz. I have to be within 20 kilohertz. I'm way better than that. I'm within 1 kilohertz. We go through the ranges. We go 10k. And we should be at 50 kilohertz. And definitely we are not. There is one pot per range, basically. Yeah. I think we were short. All right. Then you go one kilohertz. And same thing. I'm too short. Okay, that counts. And then you go to hundred. Yeah, I'm low everywhere. Oops, it looks like I missed to check the 1K range uh, ramp setting. Uh, I'll have to redo that after the video. Okay, that's close enough to 5 kilohertz. And then I continue, time 10 and R2. I wonder if that was calibrated, but with an instrument, that, with a frequency meter that was off, because it's consistently off across the band. It was kind of a systematic calibration error. Because all the rest was so far almost spot on. And that counts for 5 kilohertz. And then I go to 1. Ah, that's about correct. Yep. Okay, so here, interestingly enough, they tell us to measure period. I'm not sure why. Period A. Why would they? Well, may, maybe their instrument at the time could not measure reliably something that low. Probably couldn't do fractional counts. We do frequency. 49.99. Okay, so now we do, that's 50, that's 500, that's 5k, that's 50k, that's 500k, and that's 5 megahertz. All right, we are calibrated somewhat correctly. On wire to the sine wave adjustment, trying to minimize distortion. They call for a distortion analyzer, which I actually have, but since I have the spectrum analyzer on the bench, I'll use that instead. And you should do the same if you have a digital scope, simply use the FFT function to get the spectrum of the signal and follow the same procedure for minimizing the harmonics. So now that we're doing something even more fun, we are trying to make sure that we minimize harmonic distortion, but it's already very low. Here's my 10k fundamental, and here are the harmonics, and I think it's just perfect. It's 
10, 20, 30, 40, 55 dB down. What do they want us to do? 46 dB down. So I am better than 46 dB down. I don't think I can improve that much on this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was pretty much at the minimum. This instrument was pretty well adjusted to start with, except for frequency. I can't, yeah, so that was also at the minimum. Pretty much. So I'm amazed that you can get the harmonics so low starting from a triangle and using a diode network. We're getting close to the end. Next is DC offset adjustment for the sign, which is quite straightforward. And in this one, they have us adjust the offset to zero. And the way they do that is uh, we get to one kilohertz and then we put it at the input of a digital voltmeter and we make that less than 75 millivolts. You can try to tweak it. Yeah, there you go. Okay, we are coming to the last one, which you'll see is also the best one, the square wave overshoot adjustment. Okay, this one is the last adjustment and the most fun. It's for the overshoot of the square wave, which is right now is approximately correct. But the way you adjust it, there's a cap and a transistor, and you pull the cap further or closer to the transistor you can see it has been pulled all the way close which apparently is the correct position but you just basically bend it bending your cap that's that's the that's the most interesting tweak ever okay there you go bend it some more ah, that's pretty good what a weird adjustment Maximum, that's why. Okay, too much overshoot. Less overshoot. Not enough. Something like that. There are a few more adjustments on the next page, but I didn't do them. The first one is not an adjustable component per se, it's the famous factory selected capacitor you have to change to get perfect flatness on the top range. Since I didn't change anything in the output stage, I just ignored it. Then the last one is for the 3310B only and I have the A, so it doesn't apply to me. The B is the better instrument, by the way, it has the gating functions, so get it if you can. But that's it, we are done. You see nothing particularly difficult, but it is definitely tedious. So that's pretty much it. Um, calibrate it, and uh, now the, the frequency is spot on, so we're done with this instrument. It was pretty much in calibration except for the frequency.